So welcome to Famous When I'm Dead. I'm your host, Sam King Davis, and this is the podcast where artists tell the story of how they thrive while they're still alive. Uh, my next guest is one of the last great American sign painters, muralists, and fine art cubists. He is popular in the Midwestern United States and internationally known for his mind-bending compositions, surreal subject matter, and masterful sign lettering on storefronts ranging from donut shops to tattoo parlors. Uh, I'm genuinely honored and excited to announce St. Louis native, my homeboy, my fellow St. Louis homeboy, the talented and charismatic Phil Jarvis. Hope I can live up a half of that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll find out if you're charismatic or not during the interview. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I put my St. Louis hat on for you, actually. I don't usually All wear right. that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Looks like home. <clears throat> yeah. Looks like home. That's a, that's a nice house, man. That, where do you live? Do you live in the city or you live out of the city? I live in the city of St. Louis in the Benton Park West neighborhood. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. So did you What's get that? in? Did you get in like on uh, before like the Renaissance started happening there? I've been here for like thirteen years, so oh, wow, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a an old uh, florist that I converted into a residence. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you did a great job judging by the ceiling and the lighting and the what? You got like backlighting on that, or is that just around? Yeah, yeah. I found some I found some LEDs that you just put in the regular socket, and it has a remote control, and you can kind of control the different colors and things so you know it's kind of fun so cool yeah. how long did it take you to build that out oh it's all, it's all painted it's not anything built it's just uh um i don't know a, few, a couple of days it doesn't take long once once you get started on it oh i'm in the the building like it looks like you did some renovations on the house oh i stayed the whole house oh yeah well it's, it's a you know an ongoing process it started when i moved in and it's still going on today so nice nice yeah, I'm adding something new or fixing an old problem yeah. things you know the house was made in the 30s so it's, it's definitely has its share of uh problems but huh that's fun it's, it's up to up to par you know i can live in it easily now yeah another local artist uh did mm -hmm. something like that you know cameron fuller uh sounds familiar but i'm not really sure no. okay yeah he he had a show at slam like a few years ago right before i left and he does you know i'm surprised you don't know him he does some sign work as well um but it's more like it, it's not like on the side of buildings necessarily like he'll cut out like phrases and words and then he'll like paint that and Hmm. He's. I think he's probably a little bit more in the like the gallery scene than you are. Your yours is more like on the street and on walls and stuff. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah. It always surprises me when like people in St. Louis, for example, don't know each other, like prominent artists. Right. Yeah, that's true. We don't uh, have a uh, lots of organizations that I'm a member of anyway. Um, oh. And plus, here with uh, COVID, keeps everybody in their houses. So. Yeah. But you know William Lobdell, yeah? Yes, uh, we've had a show together at the um, Regional Arts Commission one yeah, time. Yeah, and we, yeah. were both, we were both members of uh, Art Dimensions in St. Louis when they uh -huh. existed. Yeah. yeah, I did some stuff with that uh, a few years back with mm -hmm. Art Dimensions, yeah. Yeah, it was a good group. Is it still going? I, I don't think so. I haven't, no. Uh, oh. David Weaver was the one who was kind of running it, and he's doing his own thing now, so I don't think it still exists. They had a. They did a tattoo shop, didn't they? They converted into a tattoo shop. 
down on Cherokee? Uh, I don't know what's there now. It's it's like an event hall now, um, oh. but it is on Cherokee. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it was the what was the other guy's name that was working? That. Mm. Now, there's a Justin Tolentino. There's a. a uh, Killer Napkins, which is uh, yeah, Jason, Jason Spencer, Spencer. Um, uh, Kababi. Um, I think yeah, there's there's a couple dozen of us, I guess. Yeah, I forget the other guy. He was doing some artwork, and then he started a tattoo shop down on Cherokee. Oh, uh, Justin, uh, not Justin, but um, David Chris Savatino. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. He, he he's across the street and down a ways, but yeah, tattoo artist. How's that going? How's the uh, scene on Cherokee going now? Uh, they've got uh, Yaki's has got uh, an outdoor space there. They block off the street and have small, you know, two three piece bands will play, mm-hmm. and all the seating's outside, and they you know um, serve from a, a window there. Cool. Um, there's still people walking up and down the street, and I think uh, a couple of B-side bars open still, and, and there's a couple of them that are open. They have a lot of stuff outside. Nice. But it seems to be okay. Yeah. Yeah, I always like going up there. I always like uh, visiting you know, all those areas when I come back home. I usually come back about once per year. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, you have to look me up next time. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I, you know, I've never been to the Venice Cafe. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So if I come <laughs> back, that'd be cool to have a, go there and have a, a drink. Yeah. Well, they're they're closed at the moment, but they plan on opening up in the spring again. But um, yeah, the Venice Cafe is kind of what lured me to the city in the first place. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, somebody told me about the a bar that was owned by a couple of artists, and then I eventually. Uh, moseyed on down and just fell in love with the place and the people who were running it and and uh and then it was real close to where mad art is uh, the art gallery slash police station mm-hmm. um and i ended up uh having a studio there at mad art so which was real close to the venice and that's um, still going on mad art uh well Yes and no. It's not really a gallery too much anymore. He he still does some catering. Uh, it was a restaurant, and he which the restaurant part is closed, but he still does a little bit of catering. He uh, kind of uh, fell in love with that building, uh, Ron Bouchel, because he was uh, an ex police officer, and then they actually called him back to the force because they were low on on folks. Mm. So so he's doing multiple jobs right now. Mm. Mm. So um, I want. I usually start these w- like if I can ask, kind of how you got started. I mean, we don't have to go through like a whole life story, but uh, right. it would be interesting to hear about like maybe your uh, your initial <laughs> kind of like call to art and um, the, your story or some kind of like difficulties that you may have faced along the way and kind of uh, you know the inspiration that you found are along the way are, are people that may have helped you along the way also. So yeah. like, what, what was that like first? Well, shoot, I've been doing artwork since I was a little kid and, uh, have luckily been recognized for that as a child too. So it was, uh, you know, I really never thought of being anything else. It, that's just how it was going to be. Mm. Um, then, I got a scholarship to Washington University here in St. Louis uh, for fine arts, and um, and I guess I kind of my main mentor there, Bocha, B O C C I A, who's gone now, but he um, he was a, a pretty big influence on uh, on me as to um, exposing me to artwork that was more than just a pretty still life or pretty landscape. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that was, and then, then I got married and had two kids. That kind of put a, uh, uh, slowed things down a little bit for me, you know, artistic wise. And I worked for a company, um, called BNN sign company after college. And while I was married and to raise my children, um, 
but then once is that they, is that still in existence bnn i i don't think so I are they was it on hanley yeah i right. think they are last time i checked i think they are still in business yeah well it was not hanley it was a, it was a airport road which was chambers uh, okay. which okay. intersects hanley. but it's in berkeley it's the same area yeah mm, okay yeah i don't i don't think they're around anymore tell you the okay truth. but uh that, that got me going into learning how to do sign sign lettering and um then after my kids were older i am no longer there i've been working on my own for about 12 years i guess really yeah ah, i so, thought it was longer than that yeah no well i've been doing artwork the whole time and i was doing some gallery stuff back then but um but yeah now it's now it's just busy all the time even though even through COVID, i've been uh very busy the whole time so it's been good so you went from basically high school straight into uh, washington university right and you did like a four-year degree there yes yeah yeah and then yeah. so after the after the sign come like how old were you when you had your kids oh huh. well uh Let's see. I guess I was 22. I graduated oh, so, from college and had so kids young. right away. Yeah. Yeah. So I had two of them and then I uh, was divorced and then became a single parents when they were two and two and four. Okay. Years old. So, so yeah. So it kind of took up a little bit of time, but it was yeah. fun. I enjoyed the whole thing. It was fun. Yeah. So then uh, you worked for BNN for, you know, so many years. And then right after that, like, did you transition into the career, like like your own career, or did you jump into it right away, or how did that work? Well, I was forced to jump into it right away because I still needed a job. So um, I had just moved into this house, um, so my I had a mortgage and all that, and I still had to pay my bills. So I started doing some work around the neighborhood, um, joined the Neighborhood Association here in Benton Park West. Um, got a few jobs here and there and my, my work is, um, you know, in the public. So it's, it's easy to, to advertise. I just put my little name on it and I, with my signature, had a, a, a profile of my face cause my beard was pointed. Yeah. And, um, so it was out there and in the public, everybody could see it. So it seemed to be pretty easy and, and, and for me to end, you know, new camp. It was digital, and I could take pictures and put them on MySpace or whatever it was back then. Yeah, yeah. and then um, uh, then just one thing led to another, pretty much. And, and it kind of you know, snowballed. Kind of snowballed. I got a couple of jobs um, with other designers in town that didn't have anybody who could hand paint, and so I, I worked with them. And then they happened to work with Anheuser Busch, so then Anheuser Busch found me and. And they keep me quite busy too. How does that feel to be? Because that's kind of a, a, I don't know if I want to use the word dying art, but it's definitely not as popular as it used to be with all of the printing technology. Do you, are you a part of association or do you kind of have a, a tribe of people who do that or that you're? Well, there are uh, Facebook friends and uh, people who follow, we follow each other's work and there, there's quite a few sign painters around and actually it's a it's resurging in a lot of ways as sort of a rebellion against the computer and automation and and all that so mm -hmm. so actually it's it's a kind of a prestigious thing uh to have your windows hand lettered and it's also it's a local art so if you want to um not have to be involved in, in a uh you know a multinational sign company that does vinyl lettering on or does stickers on your window than uh, to have someone to do it uh, by hand uh, just m makes you look like you're more involved in the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's just, so it's it's there's a lot of people doing it these days. So it's, it's kind of kind of fun. Was there uh, some person or some influence that you had that really kind of sparked your love for that, or how did how did you come about like moving well, from the fine actually, art to lettering? Well, it's because because I had to have a job out of college and I had two kids. So I, I, I 
I had to get a job and it was better than working at a restaurant or a clothing store or something like that. It was kind of up my alley, you know, it did, did involve paint and it involved uh, something that was visual. So um, it was pretty much an easy fit. Um, and then you just, you know, trial and error and working every day at a, at a production shop, you learn how to do things. Now, I admit when I first uh, graduated college and uh, got a job at the sign shop, um, it was all hand painting at that point, because this was back in 1980, somewhere around there. Um, and But within a couple of years, Apple came in with their computer and then the final cutting started in right away. And um, the shop evolved to one that was predominantly um, computer graphics and uh, vinyl, vinyl cutting, and then, uh, then into large format printing after that. Um, so I learned how to do all that sort of thing, but I, um, also we offered hand painting. So I was always the guy who did all that stuff. So, hmm. so um, these days I could do vinyl, but it's, uh, there's just no point in it. Like, and then plus it's, it's no cheaper or more expensive to get it done by hand. Mm. There's no equipment, so my overhead is very low. Hmm. Um, what about the fonts? Do you do you just sketch those out, or do you design those yourself? Or are you getting those from from? I'm sure you've heard of Dafont.com, yeah. Um, I haven't heard of that one, but I don't. You know, that's refreshing that you haven't heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've done a. I've been doing it for so long. I can I can look at a font pretty much and just glance at it and know what it looks like and know how to paint it. So I've just done it enough to know how to compare fonts and see what's the difference between the two and or between the, that font and one that's close to it and, and make that variation. And it's, 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 um, it's, it's, I would say it's pretty easy, but it takes a lot of time to, <laughs> to be able to learn all that. But, but um, at this point it's pretty easy. Um, are you using like, typical sort of like vinyl paint or, or acrylic paint or um i use this, the same paint i used when i started uh, it's a company called one shot uh -huh. and they, they provide um, uh, sign lettering enamels they're oil-based um, enamel paint and um, yeah I, I paint windows you can paint windows uh, over slick surfaces like metal or you can paint on brick or pretty much it has uh, a variety of applications, so it's it's um, it's my kind of go-to paint. Now, it's rather expensive, so if I'm painting a mural that's um, you know 90 feet by 30 feet or something like that, it's it's not nothing I would use. I would re use regular um, uh, latex for something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. What about um, what about airbrushing? Have you ever done that? I've done. Lots of airbrush, especially when I was working back at the shop, and then I do, you know, custom artwork on vehicles and things like that. Uh, mm. I'll use airbrush for that. Okay. I like it. I mean, I like to spray, but it seems to always have the same texture. As it's, it's, uh, you can almost always tell it's it's done with an airbrush. So I, I prefer if I'm using an airbrush just to use that as one of many tools, and. Uh, uh. Uh, use the airbrush and use brush on top of that a regular brush so um so like how much sketching goes into a piece i mean do you like totally uh get it kind of worked out before you start painting or at this point you probably can just go into it almost straight right well right it depends on on the size a lot of it if it's a like a window lettering that's maybe five by five i can sketch it with a wax pencil on the outside of the glass and then go on the inside of the glass and paint it all in reverse. If it's a, a mural that's, you know, a large scale mural that's maybe, you know, 50 feet by 20 or whatever, I, I can't really sketch the whole thing because I can't see it all at one time. I'm there right in front of it and the rest of the murals down the way. So, you know, if you're drawing even a portrait or something like that, I might be right in the middle of the eye, but the mouth is 10 feet down. So you yeah. can't really get the proportions. So on that, that particular situation, I have to have a pretty clear sketch. And then basically I just make a small grid on this small sketch and a large grid on the large wall and go square by square. 
Okay. And take the proportions. And uh, that seems to work the best. And then plus they, you know, usually have a, a scissor lift or a articulated arm lift that you can manipulate and kind of use it as a drawing tool in some ways because, uh, you know, it goes straight up, straight down, horizontal perfectly. If you do two buttons, you get a nice diagonal. So huh. you kind of use that thing as a giant drawing tool. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's kind of fun. So uh, when you, uh, I want to ask about like when you like sort of like the genesis of your, let's call it your business or your brand for lack of a better word now, um, like when you stopped being in, was that something that you, you stopped, was, was stopped abruptly or did you transition out of it or uh, I guess the real question is, is when you started going out on your own, were you getting paid right away or did you have to do a few kind of samples just to show people what you got? Well, I had been doing it for quite a while and I had a few photographs of the things I did at BNN. Basically, it was during a recession, uh, 2008, um, the, uh, that recession hit and the, the shop that I was working at, basically we used to, we had a, up to probably six employees and we were down to two, me and the boss. And basically there was just no more work. And so I was either laid off or fired, however you want to say it, but it, there was no work there. And, and I, uh, I collected unemployment for about a month and that was, it was just, it was more hassle and more time than it was worth. Yeah. Yeah. Stand in line and, and, you know, I could be out working or soliciting work. And so I just, I took one month of that and then, and then I started getting a couple of jobs in the neighborhood, um, restaurants, uh, I guess mainly restaurants. There was a massage therapy place that I, I did some work. And actually my, my uh, girlfriend at the time, she owned a, a massage therapy business and had a, a big picture window in the front. So every month I would take that as an opportunity for myself and give her a brand new ad every month. So I would take it, you know, scrape off the window and start a new one, a new new promotion or something that something to make it look as if we're changing all the time. So people would pay attention mm -hmm. and they not only paid attention to her business because it was, um, you know, always having something new and they, they would pay attention to the person who was actually doing it. So we both benefited from that and we we're both starting a business at the same time and they're both doing well now. So it's it's that it was good. Nice. Yeah, one of the reasons I, I wanted to interview you was because I always really enjoyed your work like around the city when I when I lived there. Um and also I'm I'm really just um there's just something about murals. You know, I went to Webster and uh it's very like kind of I wouldn't even call it conceptual, I would call it like more post conceptual. It was like so heady, you know, there was like right. It's such a disconnect from, it didn't really feel like it had roots in the ground, you know? And, um, yeah, the, that kind of art form of, of murals or line, uh, lettering. And, and I just love that, like old kind of aesthetic of, of sign painting and, uh, the, the whole kind of like St. Louis aesthetic is really close to my heart. So, um, and also, I've thought about doing some murals here in Prague and getting into that. And I have a few friends in the in the caricature business that have kind of branched out, and they're doing they're doing murals now too. So, um, not only did I have I always loved your work, but also you know I, I'm really interested in in getting into that. Uh, possibly, we'll see what happens. But well, you know, I do like to travel around. So yeah, if, come to Prague if you get a mural going. Just let me know. <laughs> oh yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome yeah. to collaborate. I'm doing. Uh, I'm thinking of doing one at this community garden. They just built this like pretty small like tool shed, and they just said I can come and paint on it. So oh, that's fun. Th thinking about doing some kind of Czech hero or somebody like that on that with in in my own style. Yeah, um, that's how it works. You get one, and everybody sees it, and then it, you know, then it they it, it grows. Just planting seeds, basically. Cool, so, cool. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I want to ask you about painting on glass because you you mentioned that you're you're painting it backward. Like, how long did that take to wrap your head around it, or is that is that still well, tricky? That's I, I'm I think I'm a bit dyslexic in the first place. So so when I go, to, uh, actually sometimes I'm painting on glass so often 
uh, uh, that and everything is completely backwards that when I go to paint something frontwards, I have to double think about which way the letters go because <laughs> yeah. yeah. I do it so often both ways. But uh, yeah, it's it's something you have to. Well, you know, I try to lay everything out on the front of the glass first, which is all forward. And then basically, if, if you do it from the back of the glass, uh, filling in the lines like a coloring book, basically, you know, yeah. so it's, it's not it's not too bad. If I try to do it freehand, like a, every once in a while, I just have a really rough layout just for centering and then just let it backwards. Then I have to really think about it. And sometimes I get so confused. I have to look at my I could type it in on my computer and look at that and say, which way does that? Is that a B or a D, a lowercase? You know, so <laughs> yeah. They, they look the same, only backwards. So, um, yeah. I guess, I guess my next question would be like about line confidence, because it seems like, I mean, the the work that you're doing is like, in some cases, almost looks like a stencil. And I've seen some of the videos that you have put up, and it's just. Have you ever seen these videos where it's like just a uh, a mashup of just uh, things that are nice to look at? Like people make cutting like taffy or like, oh, right. like well, satisfying that's, sort of a yeah yeah. Videos. And that's what it was. It's like when I see you're like making these like big broad strokes, and then the the brush like flattens out, and you get like the thick line and then the thin right. line. So yeah. I'm wondering like. Uh, well, when I was in when I was in high school, my sister was a, a, a gymnast, and she was always on the balance beam. And she would say that uh, when you're on a balance beam, trying to make it go to go on that straight line, you don't look at your feet; uh, you look at the end of the balance beam, and then you can walk down that pretty easily. So it's the same thing with painting in some ways. You don't really look at where your brush is; you look at where your brush wants to be, and you go towards that. And it seems to be easier to make a nice smooth line. And I guess you kind of have to allow yourself some some buffer zone. Like if it's one millimeter above where you intentionally wanted it, like it's a little bit lower, you just kind of go with it. Like you correct it as your hand moves. Yeah, but you try to get it as close as you can to perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and it's you know with with practice and with the with the right paint and the right brushes, um, uh, and you mix your paint to the right consistency. It's there's no reason why you can't get it right on the nose. So, yeah. So you're you're doing like a calligrapher essentially. Like if you have an F and it has two lines total, you're doing one full swoop line, thick and thin line variation all the way from beginning to end, right? No stopping. Well, if if it's a like an O or something that that has the same beginning point as the end, then you can do that in one stroke. And it depends upon, you know, the size as well. If it's a giant O that's six feet around, then then use, you know, different brushes, but you're probably not going to make the whole circle. But uh, for, for smaller ones that are inch and a half or even smaller, then one stroke is pretty much uh, pretty much the way to go if you can do it. The other thing too is like you're kind of like the the tattoo sign guy. I was looking through your stuff and you have like – it looks like a hundred different tattoo shops. Yeah, I've got uh, I got a whole closet full of t-shirts from tattoo shops. Oh, cool! <laughs> right, cool. Right but um, yeah, I, I did a t-shirt a, a, a tattoo shop here in St. Louis, Tower Classic Tattoos, and then I um, how, how, how did that happen? You know, with the internet it was kind of brand new at the time, and and I put stuff on there and. And everybody was jumping all around that for some reason, tattoo shops wanted want to show everybody their work online, which is un understandable. And so they kind of developed some a loosely knit uh, association where they all show each other each other's work. And since I had done a few tattoo shops here in St. Louis, the best way to show their work in some ways is to show somebody's is, is to show their sign work on the front of the window to tell mm -hmm. people who they are so they also broadcast that over the internet and other tattoo shops see it i guess uh one thing uh somebody's asked me to come down to jacksonville to do a tattoo shop down there in florida and then uh, from there chris nunez the guy who's got the ink masters 
TV show, Ink Masters and Miami Ink and things like that. He lives, of course, it was down there in Miami. And we're, we're friends with the person who I was doing the work for in Jacksonville. So I went to his place and he had like, you know, 30,000 followers or something. And he put my name out there as I was painting his sign. And then that got me doing things all over the United States for tattoo shops. And then from there, somebody from Italy saw me and said, uh, we'll fly you down to Italy to paint signs over here. So nice. I, I did that. And then he took me down to introduced me to a few other tattoo shops and you know just like one thing just kind of leads to another and then I, and which I and I like the fact that I'm I'm do a lot of work for tattoo shops because they're all artists too and mm -hmm. they and they have a uh, you know it's kind of a I don't know it's, a, it's a kind of a badge of honor to have all these uh, other artists asking me to do their artwork on their shop and so it's 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 kind of I really I really appreciate those guys and another thing about the tattoo shops that I really love is is that they don't try to uh, micromanage every everything that you're doing. They know that the best way to get a good tattoo is to um, pick the artist that you want, give them a direction, and then let them go. Yeah. And so that's what they they always uh, give me that that kind of measure of respect, and it's 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 a nice nice uh, group to work for. Yeah, yeah, probably the best <laughs> the best group of people to work for. Yeah, tattoo pretty cool. artists. Yeah. And there's yeah. such a variety. I mean, they, and they're they're very talented. It's, it's just uh, it's just amazing to me. So I, I really uh, I really like those guys. Yeah. Yeah, I had uh, I interviewed the guy who uh, is one of the co-owners of Immortal Masks. Is uh, okay. George, George Frangidakis is he's a Greek guy, but he yeah. lives in L.A. And he was saying that uh, people like they they want the most people that ask for free stuff are artists oh yeah well and, there's, a, there's a couple of, of uh, tattoo shops they have me letter quirky sayings and things around and one of the ones they that's pretty popular with them is that artists pay double they have to paint that on the window <laughs> yeah <laughs> because it's not it's mainly because a graphic artist or somebody they, they they think they know exactly what they want they've never really worked on a three-dimensional surface but they still they try to micromanage and it, it's uh it's something that that they ask what you do right off the bat and then if you're a graphic artist or an artist then they they know how to treat you differently so, yeah okay. yeah <laughs> i think in his case it was probably more like um like you know musicians and and people like that that are kind of in a different sphere um, i think visual artists probably uh weren't really that but yeah that was really interesting yeah. talking to him um, so I guess I'm curious as to like, who taught you how to paint on glass or is that just something that you kind of learned when you were at the, the sign shop or? Yeah, it was pretty much at the sign shop and, uh, window lettering when I first started this, that's the only kind of lettering they did that lettering on vehicles, um, any kind of sign work was all done by hand. So, and there's different paints, uh, to use for. Um, windows. Well, there's you know, so gold leaf, which is 23 karat gold, which is a foil that you use mm -hmm. on glass sometimes, and that's a whole different technique. The basics are always there. Just the hand control and lettering is um, no matter what kind of paint you use or what method. That those things are always skills that you use. They're transferable, mm -hmm. but um, uh, the gold leaf. It was a different animal, and it's, it's expensive, so not everybody gets it. But but it's nice stuff. Yeah, I did a a, a piece with gold leaf. Actually, it was um, there was this largemouth bass I caught when I was like twelve, and I had it taxidermied. And then later on, right before I graduated, I from college, I painted the driftwood all white, and then I uh, I painted the fish red, and then I just like gold leafed the whole fish. Oh, is that so, right? Yeah, yeah. It turned out really awesome. Yeah, there's nothing like gold. Yeah, there's that combination of like white, red, and gold is like one of my favorite color combinations. Huh. So uh, I guess I'm curious too about collaborations. Like for some reason, the Firecracker Press popped into my head when I was talking to you because I guess you guys, like when I think of your sign work and then I think of Firecracker Press, you guys kind of have the same aesthetic almost, except for obviously they're like woodcut print shop. Right. 
But right. um, what kind of collaborations have you done, like, and who with? Um, well, there's a variety. I, uh, I did a collaboration with William Lobdell and uh, Kababi Bayak um, one time, and that was and that was all fine arts. And basically, it was a collaboration where we were trying to explore ways to get out of ourselves. You know, mm -hmm. because uh, as an artist, sometimes ironically uh, you lose a lot of creative freedom because you paint yourself into a box and you can only do the thing you do and you're not really allowed to, to try to explore other possibilities anymore because it's not your style mm -hmm. so so that collaboration was a way for us to try to to um learn from each other and uh like uh, they would provide me a sketch and i would paint from their sketch or we would take one painting and uh, I paint on it a little bit and transfer it to Kababi, and then he would transfer it to Lobdell. And we would all paint on it without looking at each other. Or, or another one would be we'd all sit down and, and make well, one sketch on the table, divide that into three pieces, and then each take it back to our studios and uh, paint on it, and then bring it back together for uh, uh, one unified piece. I mean, there's, there was like six different ways we were trying to uh, get outside of our own heads in order to create artwork. Mm -hmm. and which was it was a great experience uh, so that was that collaboration other collaborations i do for you know uh anheuser-busch has its own design staff and things and they will come up with some uh artwork and just have me reproduce it on the side of a building so i guess you could say that was a collaboration of sorts mm -hmm. um, uh, but as far as working with other people i don't do that a whole lot i just i'm pretty much just me um, and me and the wall or whatever do you remember your first mural yeah i was in high school i painted oh. the background for a, a, a baptist church baptistry okay you know they, they that's where they fully emerge people to baptize them up in oh, front okay. of the church and so behind that, I painted a landscape with a dove and, you know, yeah, things like that. So, so it wasn't your typical surrealist uh, bodies chopped into pieces. Yeah. And yeah. No, like that would no, be kind of fun. <laughs> you know, if, I, if, I, if I would do it these days, I would probably make it look like a nice, serene landscape. But on closer, closer inspection, you could see all the evil going on. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't... Uh, haven't done that in a while, but no, I didn't really start doing that till after college because I, before college, everything was, my dad was a photographer and it was like, I was trying to, I thought the, the best artist was that person who could make something look like a photograph, mm. you know? So I did a lot of pre-college work trying to just, just perfect realism, mm -hmm. which was a, an advantage once I got into school and started learning that there were other ways to look at the world. Um, I already had those skills uh, mm -hmm. on us on their way to being developed as to how how to make something look real. So making something look surreal was not that big of a jump. When you're taking your uh, pencil sketches to a wall, do you like pretty much copy it right away? Like exactly? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I, in order to get the proportions, it's it's almost impossible to do it otherwise. You have to to sketch it on there at least uh, the basic lines and things to, to make sure that everything is proportional and everything mm -hmm. works from all the way down to the left and all the way to the right and up and down. So yeah, that has to be done pretty accurately. But then within that, um, there are variations that I can make and adjustments along the way, but usually nothing too major. Okay. Because because it's one thing if you got a, a painting that's uh you know eighteen by twenty four and you make a line that's not quite right you can always you know erase it and and work the painting over and over until it comes to a uh, a final painting but doing something large scale like that it's just it'd be such a waste of time to try to do something twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. What about not... digital? Have you ever tried digital? Uh, I work with Photoshop. Uh, mainly to do preliminary sketches. There, there's good things and bad things about the, the Photoshop uh, because uh, 
you can come up with a very finished looking image and you give that to the client and then they say, yeah, that's what I want. It, they expect you to do exactly what you've got there. But if it's a, uh, if I can just submit a, a pencil drawing, uh, then it has to leave a little bit up to the imagination of the, the, uh, the client. And mm -hmm. it gives me a little bit more flexibility when I'm, um, producing the final work. Mm. Mm. And uh, are you, by now you probably have it pretty down, but are you pricing by size or by time or by job? Yeah, that's always a difficult thing for me. But uh, uh, by job, mostly by size, if it's a mural. Um, and then I kind of, you know, I look at the client and if the, the client is willing to to pay top dollar, then I'll charge them top dollar. If it's if, the, if it's somebody who's just starting off on Cherokee Street, and they're you know already their budget is you know already kind of peaked out when they're fixing up the building and getting the restaurant all fixed, and the last thing they think about oh we got to have a sign, you know I I'll, I'll help them out and just and just give them a a decent price. And plus, it's in my neighborhood, so I, I want to see my neighborhood grow. So yeah, that's pretty awesome to be able to uh, drive around and see your work all around. Yes, yeah, personal gallery, the whole city. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. What about uh, what about teaching? Do you ever teach people, or do you ever take on take on students? Well, <clears throat> I took on one student one time, or uh, an apprentice for a while. I don't know. It's, it was more trouble than it was worth. Mm. Uh, and um, I, I get a lot of people asking me this all the time. But and I figure eventually, you know, when I get older, it might be something I will do more often, you know, bring some uh, younger people on and, and try to, uh, you know, help them, help them out. But right now it's, it's just trying to get the work done. Mm -hmm. and it, it's... Uh, it's just not not in the cards at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess the next question is kind of like a little off topic, but I wonder if you ever like think about your legacy, like um, you know, kind of. I live right. My studio overlooks out this window right here. This is the largest cemetery in uh, oh, is that in right? Czech Republic. Yeah. <laughs> So, and I go for walks in there often and I often think like, uh, what, what is all this work for? Like, what, like, are people even going to look at my work when I'm dead? You know, like, do you ever think about your legacy or, uh, how do you consider that? Not really. I, I know that everything I do outside, the sun's on it, it's going to fade. I, I see ghost signs all the time that have been there for maybe, you know, 50 or even a hundred years, but you know, they disappear. It's, it's gonna, they're going to disappear. I guess they're, they're still alive digitally, and that, that, that part will be around forever. And who knows how the future is going to be? Yeah. But um, no, I don't. I just, I just try to get, I just try to get it done. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really thinking about. I'm thinking about how long it's going to last. You still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, there okay. you go. You're back. Yeah, I had, had another call and kind of zapped me. Okay, yeah, I um, I don't really think about that i mean i do the more fine art work um that is is uh, mobile it's you know can be stored i suppose but that's for other people to worry about i'm you know i'm not really thinking about that too much mm -hmm. what about your kids are they making artwork um my son christopher lives in fort lauderdale florida he is a school teacher he teaches film and uh, my other son lives in El Paso, Texas. He's a professor of music theory. Oh. And so his, he does, uh, he plays the piano. Oh, so, so they're both teachers. Both teachers, both uh, in the arts of sorts, but uh, not visual painting. Yeah. Cool, cool. Yeah. So I have uh, a couple of, like, specific questions, and then I want to do... I'm actually starting like a new a new section on the podcast here. Um, I call it rapid fire. So it's just like okay. ten ten real quick questions. But before I get into that, I do have some more like um, kind of I guess 
career questions or whatever, or like more, let's say serious questions. Um, so we kind of covered this a little bit earlier, but, um, is there like a pivotal moment in your life or was there a lesson that you learned or an encounter that you had that shaped who you are and the way that you work now? Uh, well, not really. Cause like I said, I was, uh, I've been doing it since I was a little kid. I guess uh, going to Wash U was a, a, a big eye-opening experience, and it, it uh, allowed me to look at the world in a in a in a different way, and and uh, it taught me to um, explore new possibilities and and not be settled. So, okay. so I guess if anything, maybe that. Cool. Uh, and then, uh, what would you say are the top two qualities a person needs to apply in order to master a form, like master an art form? Um, perseverance, and just just keep working on it. You know, I mean, you, you can. I always try when I'm actually doing a single painting. I try not to sit and stare at it too too long without actually putting the brush on it, because I can paint the whole thing in my head. And not, uh, and then once I put uh, a new stroke on the canvas, it all changes anyway. So it's like, yeah. so it's basically you just have to keep working and don't think about it a whole lot. You know, just keep producing. I would guess that's with any skill. Mm. You know, if you're playing the piano, if you want to get good at it, you you practice every day. You just practice and, and get it done. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah, I never thought of perseverance until you just said that. I never really thought of perseverance on like a piece by piece basis. I always thought of it as more of a long term thing. Right. Um but yeah, it reminds me of this Einstein quote. He he was saying that like I think it goes like I'm not any smarter than any of you. I'm just willing to stick with the problems longer. Yeah. And yeah, yeah I really like that concept because um Actually, the last guy I interviewed, he's a he's like a uh, Belgian caricature master, and he was saying that like he doesn't believe in talent. And I th I thought, oh, that's that's actually a really good way to think about it because you know, when people see my work and they're like, oh my god, you're so talented, it's like, well, right. it's not really talent, you know, it's, a lot of it's work. practice. It's a lot of work. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I I have a hard time with that word too. It's like they people who say that think that well you were just born and there it is you you were you're as good as you are always yeah and, and, you know there's it takes it takes a lot of work and a lot of learning and a lot of uh, um, trial and error and making mistakes and keep pushing forward and 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 eventually get to the place that you're at now and I guess you know it's just being a human being you, you it's the same thing you just live life and and end up where you're at. But um, now, I, uh, as far as talent goes, I'm. There might be uh, a propensity to to be somebody who's more visually oriented. Mm, uh, yeah. But and but there's like lots of people like that, but few people pursue it, and some some don't. So I, and maybe that was would be what you would call talent. I'm not sure. Yeah, or maybe like a, a predisposition yeah. to that, or like a willingness to stick with that one particular thing longer. But yeah, that's the only evidence of like what you might call talent is just, I, you know, I would just replace the word with predisposition, you know, or like a, a certain set of circumstances that kind of lined up in a way that, right. you know, caused that person to go that route. Um, There's a lot, of, a lot of tall people who were born tall, but not all of them were basketball players. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another thing, too, is um, that I try to tell this to, like, artists, our younger artists who are, like, having a tough time or um, that are, are wanting to get into the career, which is, like, if you just keep doing it, like, and you, you stick with it for 5 or 10 or 15 years, like, you are going to get better and on right. top of that, like the 20 friends that you have that are doing it, it's probably going to whittle down to like maybe two, you know? Yeah. So eventually like you're going to become the artistic guy, you know, like in, right. in your social group. And then when you get to that point, then things like, like you said, like things just kind of like roll, roll on from there. Right. Um, 
just with your signature basically and having stuff out and about. Right. Um, I do think that like the media landscape is changing now and it's becoming like a little bit more difficult because, you know, if you knew 10 artists before, like with the internet, now, you know, a thousand, you know, and they're all good, you know? So, yeah, that that could be discouraging. I would think for some, for a younger artist, because it's like, oh, there's, everybody's better than me. You know, that's, that's, that's your, your social group is only artists or something like that. And that's, you know, I'll never compete with that, but yeah, it, 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 you develop as a person, your personality develops and your painting develops right along with it. If you're, Mm -hmm. if you're, you're working at yeah another interesting thing that i find out about artists that i know and people that i interview is that um the person's artwork and the way they go about it really reflects their personality and this is actually especially true with um with the caricature community right. because I'm, I'm a part of the the international society of caricature artists and um you know we get together every year and have this big conference and, you know, if the person is, like, really wild, they have this, like, really adventurous personality. Their caricatures are, like, super exaggerated and crazy. And then the people who are, like, really kind of nerdy and sort of, like, you know, organized, let's say, right. uh, their artwork is very, like, you know, uh, much closer to portraiture and, like, more, you know, mm-hmm. precise, you know. So yeah. Good observation. I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's probably true of, of any artist, music, or, or anything that's it's, it's that eventually your personality and your artwork is basically an expression of your personality. I mean, if you, if you get to where you really want to be, where you should be, it's, it's that, that what you're painting is who you are. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, I can see, I can see that. So I guess, uh, last serious question. Um, what would you say that your biggest three influences are artistically or like in life? It doesn't have to be in the field of art, but um, just like three major influences on your life. And it, and it could be a TV show. It could be a person. It could be another artist. Oh, um, well, it's hard. To, uh, I guess my parents, you'd, you'd have to say that they, they pushed me in the direction of uh, doing artwork. Um, uh, I guess Ed Bosch at WashU, who I mentioned earlier, was kind of uh, uh, the person I looked up to as as being a person who was really just uh, allowing it the artwork to happen and and uh, not being too careful about um, every little brushstroke. But um, I. I don't know. Other other than that, I'm a, my kids are I'm a, I'm their biggest fan. <laughs> cool, cool. Oh, yeah. Okay, you ready for the rapid fire? All right, go for it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, stand up or skit comedy? Uh, skit. Okay. And if you were on death row, what would be your last meal? Uh, Skittles. Really? The regular sweet kind or the sour kind? Oh, the sour kind. I'll take the sour kind. <laughs> yeah. You know my wife gets them imported into Prague because you can't... Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah. They don't sell the same like level of sour here in, in Europe oh, that they right? do there. Yeah. <laughs> when I was a kid, actually, we used to eat these sour balls. Do you remember them? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they look good. Oh. I still like those. Oh, yeah. Your tongue would bleed. You would eat so many yeah. of them. Yeah. <laughs> That had to be a that had to be a health hazard. Uh, okay, right. so chemicals. So, like, uh, what book are you reading, or what show are you watching now? Uh, what show am I watching? I watched The West Wing. I kind of finished that off. Nice. Um, and actually, I'm watching something. Is it Sixty Days? It's a they go into a prison uh-huh. and and kind of undercover and watch that's a documentary sort of thing. I don't know. My uh, my girlfriend now is a, uh, a defense attorney for death row inmates, so this stuff is kind of uh, interesting to watch. Yeah, well, that's interesting that I said if you were on death row, what would be your I know, right? Meal? <laughs> <laughs> so I thought about that one already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah no, and about... actually, she talks about a lot of, uh, of the inmates who end their last request, and, and because she's usually the last person who's with them before they have to go to the chair whoa 
That's um, really that's, that's really heavy. Heavy stuff. All right. Right. Yeah. And how how I don't know. That's a whole different subject right there. <laughs> Oh man, that's really interesting. Yeah, my wife would be super interested in that. She's always listening to like the the death mystery shows and these podcasts right. about like, you know, murder mysteries. So if she wanted to get rid of me, she would definitely know how to like get rid of she's my body. That's what yeah. she's doing. She's figuring that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's mastering that. She's persisting. Yeah. There you go. Um, so what artists do the listeners need to look at? Oh geez, I'm I'm so bad at names. That's one of my things that I'm not talented at. <laughs> um, you're, a, you're a letter guy, and you don't remember names. I don't remember names. I spell things backwards. Uh, you know, it's, it's just messed up. But um, I look at everybody. I mean, I I look at you know Picasso the same way I would look at a Rembrandt. I just I look at them and see what they brought to the table and what what makes them unique and in, in what gives them a voice and and i'm always looking at, at, at new artists and from all genres and just and trying to uh appreciate it i don't i don't know there's just there's just so much to to look at i'd hate to point it pinpoint it to one or two people anybody on your radar right now or like that you've most recently looked at um there's a guy named berlin i think it is like I, especially on the internet, I, I flash through the pictures so often I don't even look at who it is, but I recognize the same artist over and over. Um, I think this guy is in, a Berlin guy is in Spain or Madrid, but he does portraits, abstract realism slash cubism. I, I don't know. It's, huh. it's hard. I don't know that I'm looking at anybody in particular. There's an. There's an artist that I think you would like. He's a, actually a caricature artist. His name is Chris Chua. And uh, he's kind of like the Picasso of caricature. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, I'll send... uh, it sounds familiar, but yeah, send me, send me a link. That'd be good. Yeah, yeah. He's pretty rad. He's been developing this Cubist style for a while. And he's just to totally off the deep end. It's like, uh, they're, they're pretty awesome. Yeah, cool. Okay, what's the next one? Oh, favorite color or color combo? <laughs> I always tell people clear. It's my favorite color because it okay. reflects all the colors or refracts all the colors around it. It <laughs> doesn't have its own thing. That's a good um, answer. I, I'm not really into uh, specific colors. I guess when I was a, in kindergarten, I liked purple and blues together, but that's that was in kindergarten. <laughs> yeah. And so for, still... so now I like lots of different combinations. Different combinations of colors um, evoke different moods. Uh, different they have different spatial relationships so it's, uh, the color is kind of specific to its uh environment yeah so all right we're gonna go with transparent then okay transparent definitely yeah. did not expect that answer <laughs> <laughs> um try favorite to find that in your crayon box say what they try to find that in your crayon box yeah yeah well, I have something. I have a blending, uh, blending stick. Oh, oh there, right. Transparent. Yeah. There you go. I do have a. Uh, I have these colors that I bought in Korea that are like gel. They're almost like highlighters, but they're like gel. Oh so yeah. You, you can like God. smush them on the page, and like you, the colors behind it kind of come through, and it sort of right. tints huh. the colors behind it and makes it almost look like a filter. There you so, go. Um. So. What about a uh, favorite band or musician? New band or musician? Newish. Uh, yeah, that's one too. I listen to a lot of twenties music and and uh, really old jazz stuff. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Um. I. This sounds pretty pedestrian, but uh, I like um, Billy Eilish. Uh huh. I listened to her. I was listening to her from the very beginning. I thought this girl's gonna make it, and, and she's done pretty well for herself. Ah, cool, so, cool. Um, otherwise, it's uh, I do. I listen to local bands here in St. Louis. And I used to like to to go and listen to the bands. Of course, these days are that's that's a bit restricted, and a lot of musicians are having a tough time right now. Like but, Rum uh, Drum Ramblers and Rum Drum Ramblers. Yeah, uh, those guys are fun. 
the bottom up blues gang. Um, Man, you got St. Louis in your bones. Yeah. <laughs> Sign painting, 1920s music. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of fun background music. I, I can listen to something and not uh, have to think a whole lot and just let it play. Yeah. So, yeah. Where does Jarvis come from? Where does that name come from? I, we come from the, the woods of Missouri, someplace. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's uh, the origins. I, there are a lot of Jarvises in Scotland and Britain. In Britain, so I'm, I'm okay. thinking it's pretty from around there. The Appalachian Trail. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. My so, family, my grandparents, they they live back in the woods, literally. Okay. So. Making making moonshine and. Well, uh, yeah, uh, but they don't think they got the moonshine because they were very Southern Baptist, so they didn't <laughs> they didn't okay. believe in that sort of thing. But okay. But uh, yeah. So, uh, what about uh, aside from COVID? What's what's getting your goat? And I didn't use that phrase because you have a goat beard. I just uh, thought. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so what what's kind of irritating you right now about culture? Like uh, what's, what's, politics. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's a uh, it's uh, kind of a frustrating thing when when uh, the president's trying to turn the election around with no evidence whatsoever. It's just, it's just a mess. And it's just not going the way that's not being a, a transaction that should be fairly easy. But anyway, that kind of gets my goat a little bit. Okay. Um, so the next one, if you had a billion dollars, what would you do? Give away most of it, at least half of it. At least and, half. And, okay. <laughs> At least half, and then uh, then uh, half of that probably goes to the government. Um, so I'm left with two hundred fifty thousand. Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> no, you'd you'd have two hundred fifty million. Two hundred fifty million. Oh well, wow, that's even better. Yeah. Yeah. Then I'd be lost. I'd have to give away half of that again. I just you know I don't know what to do with it. I'm <laughs> happy with what I've got, so it's like I don't know anything that I need. I guess I'd pay off my house. Yeah. You know. I think the only okay. selfish thing that I would do is I would probably buy a Lamborghini. Oh, is that right? That's that's the only selfish thing I would do. The well, rest of it would be... You'd have to put money in the bank because each year there's a new one that comes out, so you're going to have to <laughs> yeah. keep, keep that up over time. Yeah. I don't know, man. I, I They're cool looking, but I'm sure they're not very convenient. No, I mean they're they're just it's it's an absolute ego. It's like the purest right. form of an ego trip, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I guess I could buy some artwork that I I like. Maybe buy a few Picassos and things, and sit them around. Yeah, it'd be and cool. Then to, I, then uh, I would go. Then I'd do a. I'd definitely be helping the my local neighborhood and yeah, you know, yeah. Getting, maybe getting the whole all the streets fixed and all the lights fixed and you know th things like that. Yeah, to, yeah. To push this whole area. So yeah, well, that'd be it feels fun. feels good to think about that, right? Like it would be nice if we could actually just do that, right? Oh sure. Yeah. So if you come across a million dollars and you're looking for you to give it away, then I'll let you know. Part than here. <laughs> Speaking of that, I was wondering what was going on in uh, North St. Louis now. Is the is the geospatial agency finished? Uh, I couldn't tell you. Okay. I haven't heard anything about that lately. Okay. I mean, they are developing up that way, but I don't you know. Hmm. Still a lot of crime up that way. Yeah. What about Benton Park West? Is the crime getting better there? Uh. Is it is it getting better? It's, there's less of it. I guess there is. And I haven't heard anything lately. I mean, it's always a struggle. Uh, mm -hmm. But <clears throat> but there's a lot of rehabs going on. Uh, <clears throat> some, you know, they're taking a lot of old buildings and, and making them look new again. A lot of four families and two families and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So there's, there's a lot of development going here that's positive. What would you need to buy a uh, four-family flat in that neighborhood now? Benton Park West is starting to come up, really. It's been coming up for a while now. Yeah, it's doing well. Um, well, it depends. I mean, some of the houses uh, that haven't had any care for 100 years, or you can probably buy them for a song, you know, 10000 bucks or something like that. They were trying to uh, – the government helps you to uh, finance that. You'd but, have to um, put 100000 in, yeah. Right, you have to put one hundred, one hundred fifty thousand in. Like the house that's right next door to me, I think they bought it for thirty-five thousand dollars, which is nothing, and they sold it for four hundred. Whoa! So, so yeah, it was a big, a big change. But they did a lot of work. They probably put 
150, 200,000 in it, but still that's quite a profit. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of that going on in the neighborhood. So which is mm. good stuff. Okay. So let's see if you're trapped on an Island, what book would you bring? I guess it could be an album too. It doesn't have to be a book. It would be a, a book with blank pages that I could ah, actually draw on. Good answer, yeah. <laughs> okay, and last question. One nugget of wisdom for young artists. Or I guess young people. Uh, From an old guy. Just uh, do it, yeah, <laughs> right. Just uh, do it that you do what you want to do. do. Do things that are that make you happy. Uh, if if uh, drawing a particular way makes you happy and nobody else likes it, that, who cares? Just do it anyway and and um, see where it goes. And then from one from one drawing to the next, you you improve every time. It, it's it and it that help that happens even with me today. You know, if I'm a, if I'm doing a painting, especially if I'm doing fine art, um, each each one is a new learning experience and you, you gain from it. So nice. Again, persevere. Cool. That's it. That's an hour. Okay. Well, that's yeah. quick. Yeah, it goes quick. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, it's it's really it is really a pleasure and an honor to finally talk to you. I mean, we've we've talked. I mean, we've met briefly a couple times a, a long time ago, but it's cool to finally like kind of dig in and and get to know you better. And yeah, it was a fun interview. And, and... All right, cool, man. Well, great connecting with you, and I'll talk to you soon, and I'll keep you posted on uh, when the interview comes out. I'll probably try to release it this week, actually. Okay, great. That'll be fun to watch. All right. Uh, <laughs> all right, thanks. Thanks, Phil. All right, yeah. have a good one. Bye. Happy painting. Bye.